Hello and welcome back. This is week nine of MC100. We will be talking this week about sound recording and the popular music industry. This week, we're going to break away from our normal video formats, which typically run history, industry, social issues, because this chapter really talks about two distinct uh, things. First, how sound is recorded, and then the impact of music through the ages. So this video will look primarily at the sound recording history, how it developed, uh, it, as well as the current recording industry. Now, the history of sound recording started back in the 1850s with this gentleman, Edward Leon Scott de Martinville. He actually used hog's hair bristle as a needle and etched grooves into a revolving cylinder coated with carbon powder. The only problem with his recording is that he couldn't play it back, so he was able to record the sound onto the cylinder, but it, there was no playback. And so it, it didn't serve a great purpose other than inspiring future inventors. In April, 1860, he recorded the first known voice recording. However, because it couldn't be played back, it took developing digital technologies back in 2008 to be able to play it back for the very first time. So it's kind of cool that now we can hear the first voice recording. This stage in the history of sound recording is known as the development age because it's the time when the new technologies were developing. Now, in 1877, this gentleman, who you may be familiar with, Thomas Edison, had the first playback of sound. He used a needle to etch grooves in tinfoil. It was known as the phonograph, which are the Greek words for sound and writing. And Edison's inventions were really the entrepreneurial stage because it was the time when inventors were starting to think about how they could use their sound recordings for business purposes. In fact, Edison actually invented this as the very first answering machine. Here's an example of the recordings from the 1877 tinfoil recording. So you can see it's not the best quality of sound. However, it did begin to develop and inspire others to refine the technology. In 1886, Bell and Tainter uh, patented the graphophone, which used wax cylinders. However, despite the durable wax uh, cylinders being great for recording, they were not very durable for repeated playback. And so you could usually play them back only once or twice before the wax began to reshape or fall apart altogether. Here's an example of that. In fact, uh, you may notice that as they are recording the sound, the person recording has to blow out the wax to keep it from, from changing the grooves. <laughs> Now you can hear the recording. Much better quality. So pretty neat. And so it was the graphophone that really inspired the 1887 Berliner gramophone. And a gramophone used flat discs made out of zinc and coated in beeswax. They may look pretty familiar. They're what inspired vinyl. Uh, so they were also able to develop mass production techniques 
for the discs so that uh, people could own a gramophone and then buy the individual discs. And within that pr production technique, what they would do is they would create labels that included the title, the performer, and the songwriter. And this was really the development of the star system in the United States because people would listen to one of these recordings uh, from their favorite uh, performer, and then they would try to find the same recordings from that performer or label or songwriter. And this really developed the first stars in the United States. This really uh, grew the mass medium stage for sound recording because by the 1900s, the gramophone was widely available. In fact, in 1906, Victrola uh, provided a hand crank version, which you can see in this picture, um, that uh, really kind of made it more easily accessible, made it easier to have in the home. And by the 1940s, uh, vinyl records were invented due to World War II uh, production. And so we really see the development of uh, records and sound recording in this stage. Here's an example of a Victrola, one of the hand cranked ones playing a old record. And there it goes spinning. You put down the needle. Imperial Orchestra, Tropophone Company, Toledo, Ohio. <laughs> So those are really amazing machines. Uh, the Victrola was a big movement for the history of sound and the history of music in America because it made it widely accessible to many people. Now, by 1948, CBS Records was using 33 and a third RPM long playing records known as LPs, and they were actually 20 minutes on each side. So while um, the Victrola records typically only had one to two songs on the maximum, and then they were only on one side of the disc, uh, the LP allowed for longer playing uh, music and then the ability to flip the record over so that you could have two different sides to listen to. Um, now, this really marketed multi-song albums as well as the ability to play classical music, which is much longer um, thanks to the development of LPs. In 1949, RCA actually released uh, 45s excuse my dog barking she's just really excited about the history of sound development apparently and the 45s used a quarter size hole which made it great for jukeboxes and if you know anything about the late 40s and early 50s this was one of the popular ways that music was released through these jukeboxes where people could listen to them together now, 33 and a third and 45s were not compatible to play together, but in 1953, the compromise was released where uh, you had LPs for long playing music and 45s for singles, and record players really could play both, um, and so that allowed for these two mediums to work together. In the 1940s, uh, magnetic audio tape was uh, became more widely popular. It was actually invented all the way back in the 20s in 1929, and the technology was refined through the 30s. This allowed for sound editing and multi-track mixing. Um, so if you have ever heard of a mixtape, uh, that was kind of the love language of my era where you could, you know, mix different tracks and make your friends or your boyfriend a, you know, mixtape. Uh, it was, it was pretty cool back then because it was new technology. Uh, even, even in the sixties and seventies, you know, when, um, 
even though the technology had been developed, it wasn't really until the late seventies when these became super popular. Um, so they also allowed for stereo sound, which was the more natural sound distribution. It didn't have that like tinny sound that you sometimes get with vinyl records. By the sixties, people were home dubbing, which means to record records, uh, to the audio tape or even recording songs off the radio for home use. And by the seventies record sales were plummeting while blank cassette sales were doubling and it paved the way for the Sony Walkman and other, uh, magnetic audio tape players to be sold. In the seventies, Thomas Stockholm, uh, made the first digital recording. And by the seventies, Sony and Philips were working together to design digitally recorded discs. Uh, by 1983, these became compact discs, also known as CDs. And the first player was so sold by Sony in 1983 for over a thousand dollars because the technology was so new and innovative. But by the year 2000, CDs had made records and tapes almost obsolete. And um, the development of CDR much later, unfortunately, was kind of the beginning of the end for CDs themselves, because like the audio tape, the magnetic audio tape that allowed for mixing and sound editing from home, CDRs made it possible to take files and place them onto a compact disc. Um, and it, it kind of ushered in the allowance for uh, things like Napster, where people would essentially steal MP3s through digital downloads. In 1992, MP3s uh, were created, uh, digital recordings uh, could be compressed and placed onto a CD. Uh, this became very popular during the rise of the web in the mid nineties. And in 1999, Napster made MP3s mainstream by offering all different types of music, uh, available to the public. The only problem was they didn't actually own that music. And so in 2001, the Supreme Court of the United States ruled against Napster, saying that they were violating copyright law. So the next few years after 2001 were really spent by these uh, digital and web companies trying to figure out who owns the sound recording and how can we make them widely available to people while not violating copyright law. So iTunes became the number one music retailer in the United States back in 2008. It surpassed Walmart in its ability to sell music um, because you didn't have to go and buy a disc anymore. You could just download it straight to your computer and then get it on your iPod or other digital device. In 2019, there are more than four, 40 billion songs sold by iTunes. In 2018, almost 40% of listeners still illegally download music for online offline listening. Um, and so it's important to keep in mind that this is still illegal, um, according to the Supreme Court ruling. And that is for individual users as well as companies. So keep that in mind. Now, uh, in the same era, we see uh, digital streaming devices like Pandora, Rhapsody, Spotify, and iTunes radio becoming extremely popular. By 2019, uh, audio streams were up 32%, where there are over 705 billion audio streams in 2019. 85% of all U.S. music consumption actually comes from this on-demand streaming. Um, and uh, in total, uh, th there were, between all of the companies, uh, there was over 1 trillion music streams. So uh, pretty impressive. I know that um, most of our students really love Spotify, Pandora, Apple Music. So um, this is becoming a very important part of the music industry and sound recording. So despite this growing uh, prevalence of um, digital music, we still see kind of a hearkening back to the original days of sound recording. In 2018, there were more vinyl record sales 
um, than uh, as there were in 1988. And so we can see that vinyl is starting to become very popular again. Let's watch this. Finally, tonight, streaming and digital downloads have made it more convenient than ever to be a music fan. But convenience isn't everything. Sales are up more than 50% this year for vinyl records. Yes, the hottest way to listen to music in 1915 is also one of the hottest ways in 2015. Here's Kevin Tibbles. In a cavernous New Jersey warehouse, Dave Miller brings the dinosaurs back to life. I'm literally trying to wake them up after a long sleep. <laughs> Not so long ago, many assumed the old-fashioned vinyl record was extinct, buried under the cloud of digital music. Flat, black, and round. They go on a turntable, and they look at me like, they still make them? That tune's changed. Dave Hansen's firing up machines that are a half century old. And we'll use them for spares when things break. It's like your own boneyard. It's a great time for records. Uh, everyone's buying vinyl in the country. He plans to produce a million LPs a year for a new market of young consumers. Down the road at the record collector, owner John Shrembanis says his online record sales are booming. Why is vinyl making a comeback? It's more fun. For everyone who thought all those dusty records in the basement were completely obsolete, think again. Hey, Peter Frampton. So you can see that some of the, these technologies reemerge over time. Um, I know I own uh, my vinyl record player. I love playing a lot of my classic rock hits. Uh, my husband plays uh, more current hits like Dave Matthews or uh, Eric Church. But I love listening to the Beatles or um, Fleetwood Mac, things like that on my record player. It just is a different experience. But uh it's important to note that at a certain point, um, right around the 1915, the record and sound recording industry really met with the radio industry. And it was a large clash at the time because there weren't the boundaries and guidelines that there are now. So by 1950, the phonograph was very, very popular. In fact, 30 million records were sold um, and it tripled each year through the end of that decade. But by 1924, radio comes on the scenes and record sales just plummeted to half of the previous year's total. It's because people were interested in listening to their music on the radio rather than just listening to it by themselves. So radio broadcasted music originally without ever compensating the music industry. The only cost to the radio station to play music was to actually purchase the uh, vinyl itself um, or the, the records, depending upon the era. And so by 1925, the American Society of Composers, Authors, and Publishers charged stations between $250 and $2,500 a week to be able to air music. So to get around that, stations started bringing in live in-house bands uh, to broadcast those instead. Uh, record sales really got a boost at the end of uh, Prohibition, if you think about it. Um, you, you had a lot of people who were um, trying to do dance halls and, and things like that. So it really was about kind of that group need for music. Now, radio and recording industries began cooperating uh, uh, once the TV era caught on in the 1950s. I think both the radio industry and the recording industry realized that they could become obsolete if uh, TV became the mass media to replace them. And so they began working together. The only problem was sometimes they worked together a little too much, and that led to payola. Payola is the term used when promoters for a recording industry would pay radio DJs to play songs by artists that they represented. So it's kind of like, you know, if, if you were listening to the radio today, how do you know whether that song is really number one or not? Well, what was happening was, um, the representatives of the artists were paying the DJs to say, this is the hot new single when it 
maybe wasn't. Um, and so it was deemed to be bribery, but there were no laws against it uh, during the er- during this era that this really began happening. It wasn't until 1959 when congressional hearings into fraudulent business practices uh, gave them a chance to blame DJs for rock and roll's negative impact on teens. And so there was really this investigation into payola Uh, during this time led by Congress because they were upset with the moral implications of rock and roll. Now, one of the most famous uh, DJs uh, in Chicago, uh, Phil Lind, played secret tapes showing these conversations between promoters and DJs. And it was really uh, quite controversial at the time. In fact, Alan Freed, who uh, was one of the largest voices of radio, admitted to participating in Paola. Now, Dick Clark, uh, who you may know from American Bandstand or maybe, you know, when he was doing the New Year's Eve show um, prior to Ryan Seacrest, uh, Dick Clark actually denied involvement in Paola, but it has been a long thought that he most likely participated in it. Uh, now, a record label um, during this time actually admitted to paying over $22,000 to a radio station uh, DJ for um, for the their record that they were representing to get airtime. So you can see this had very large implications. The Federal Communications Act was uh, created after these uh, congressional hearings, and it creates a fine of $10,000 or one year in jail for every violation of payola. So payola is no longer allowed, although some people still suspect that it could be going on. Now, in terms of the business of sound recording, Uh, The peak of the sound recording industry or the music industry was actually in 1999 when it was bringing in uh, $14.5 billion. But in 2019, last year, it it was still pretty healthy. It was uh, $11 billion in in sales. Now, U.S. markets make up a third of all global sales. So the United States is a very large force in terms of buying music. Now, there are certain um, entities called uh, oligopies, which are when a few businesses control most of the production and distribution. So just like in other companies where you have like these large owners who control most of the industry, in sound recording or music industry, you have three major labels, Universal Music Group, Sony Music Entertainment, and Warner Music Group, and they control Uh, probably over 60% of the market in the United States. Now, independent record labels tend to discover trends and they make up about 40% of the market. Uh, Their market share has grown a lot in recent years due to uh, downloads and streaming and other technologies that make sound mixing and uh, recording a little more accessible to an independent shop. Now, uh, 2018 was a strong year for um, artists and other uh, record labels. Now, you can see the major three, but then uh, artists directly publishing their their own music, they made up 3% of an $18 billion industry. So you can see many artists are um, trying to produce their, their own music and cutting out these companies. In terms of revenue, uh, the revenues are continuing to grow, but they're shifting in terms of where the money is coming from. In in, uh, 2015, streaming made up only about 34% of the industry, while physical physical sales made up 28. Digital downloads were still only at 34%. But if you go all the way over to 2019 on the far right, you can see streaming now makes up uh, almost 80% of the music industry's revenue. Digital downloads uh, make up 8%, while physical sales still make up 10%. Now, 2015 was the first time that streaming made up the largest revenue portion. And in 2016, that was the first year that streaming made up the majority of the revenue. And so, It's uh, streaming is becoming a very large part of the music industry. 
but who actually gets paid? You know, when you buy um, something or you stream something, who is getting this money? Well, the U.S. record industry produces about $9.8 billion in retail revenues each year. So about 67% of that, or $6.6 billion, gets paid out to the labels and the artists, the people who are producing the music. But record stores, download stores, and streaming services keep almost 33% of that, $3.2 billion. So you can see being the sound recording or, uh, you know, the digital download side, the people who sell the music uh, is still a very profitable business. Now, artists make money through royalties. Royalties are money paid to a composer for each performance of the work. Now, CD sales typically have a royalty of about 8 to 12% for each CD sold. That goes back to the artist. But if you're a more established artist like Taylor Swift or Beyonce, you're probably making more like 15% on your sales, your CD sale royalties. That's negotiated within a contract. Your digital sales royalty is typically about 15%. So if you're a smaller artist and not as established, then you're probably wanting to focus on digital sales as opposed to physical CD sales. A performance royalty is paid when a song is played on the radio, on TV, film, just any time that it appears in public with your permission. Um, now, over the air, radio stations tend to pay a licensing fee of one5 to 2% of their total revenues. So it can add up pretty quickly. Now, large internet stations have to pay up to 25% in order to have the performance royalty and play these songs. A mechanical royalty actually goes to the songwriter and almost always a songwriter's take home is nine cents a song. So anytime that a song is played, nine cents of the revenue goes back to the songwriter. Uh, synchronization royalty is paid for a song used in a video format like TV, movies, or commercials. So on top of a performance royalty, um, you can also get a synchronization royalty. So iTunes uh, keeps about 30% of the cost of what you pay for a song. So in uh, 90, you know, let's say it's a dollar that you pay for a download. I think it's a little more than that now. Um, but if you pay a dollar, then 30% or 30 cents of that song goes back to Apple. Um, iTunes actually sold a lot of the music that it had purchased, it sold about 30% of it uh, back in 2003. Uh, and iTunes, as we know it, is kind of being phased out by their, their new uh, organization, their new platform, Apple Music, which is more of a streaming service. Internet radio uh, pays about 0 0.002 cents uh, per play per listener. Spotify uh, or other streaming services pay about 0 0.007 cents per play per listener. So you have to get a lot of listens on a streaming service to be able to make any money. So think about the synchronization royalty that we just talked about. So YouTube actually pays a dollar per a thousand streams. So this video over here, which you may remember, uh, the office actually... Uh, did a remake of this. Yeah, you may remember that one. Well, this video has been played over a hundred million times. So the synchronization royalty for this video alone is a hundred thousand um, dollars. Other uh, websites or streaming services tend to pay 15% of their ad revenues back to artists. So streaming takes a lot more plays to earn the same money as a download would. So it takes about 1500 streams uh, from an album to equal one album sale. So you can see you have to generate a lot more streams in order to make the same money as you would for an album. So for individual songs, it's about 150 song streams versus one single sale. 
Compensation again varies. We just kind of looked at this. Uh, for every thousand streams, Apple Music will pay roughly twelve dollars and fifty cents. Spotify Spotify play, pays seven dollars and fifty cents, and YouTube pays a dollar for every thousand streams. There are over twenty million licensed songs on Spotify, and uh, twenty thousand songs are added daily. So you, it's pretty easy to get lost as an artist. In fact, uh, Spotify says that 20% of the songs that are on their platform never get played. So it can be very, very difficult working in the music industry. So in terms of who gets the profits, we talked about, you know, the label and the artists get 67% of the industry sales. Well, here's how it's broken down. The music label gets the most money. Um, so this would be for, you know, an $18 CD that you would buy at a store. Here's how it's broken out. So uh, over half of it goes to the music label. The retailer gets the other portion and artists will really only make about $2 off of their uh, entire CD while a songwriter only makes nine cents. But in terms of an iTunes download, um, you know, for a dollar twenty nine iTunes download, again, the music label still makes the majority, but they don't make over fifty percent, so they make less on a, a digital download. Uh, Apple keeps roughly thirty percent of your money, and then the artist gets fifteen percent, and the songwriter gets nine cents. But nine cents is a lot more for a download um, than it would be for your entire CD. Independent record labels are the major risk takers in the music industry. Uh, Big Machine Records was actually the company that first promoted Taylor Swift, but then she left and signed with Universal Music Group, which was one of the big three, you may remember. Uh, Big Machine Records actually kept her original songs in, in their songbook and refused to allow her to play them until very recently. Uh, but they made a lot of money off of Taylor Swift but it's really taking those risks on those newer artists, not knowing whether or not they'll be successful. But many singers are turning to the web or social media to promote themselves instead of going through a traditional label. You may remember Colby Calais and Adele got famous on MySpace way back in the day. Justin Bieber, um, you know, and others have been very famous on YouTube. And there are certain artists who bypass labels entirely, even after they become famous, like Radiohead or Macklemore. So now that you understand a little bit more about the recording industry, I want you to go into the discussion post to talk about how the industry is changing ways that they reach music audiences. Then go into our second video for this week and look at uh, popular music and then do your discussion post on music's impact through the ages. I have offered um, a guest speaker video here about um, how radio DJs um, work. And we have someone from WDJC who will be discussing his career as a radio music host. Finally, uh, you will have your worksheet for exam two, so you can begin preparing for that exam, which takes place next week. If you have any other questions, please let me know. Uh, otherwise, make sure you watch uh, the popular music video as well.